gathering, we're, we're launching a healing, infilling, deliverance, really a worship service. It's not a service. It's not a formal, uh, it's, it's music and a message, uh, but deep, anointed, deep, 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 spirit-filled touch from the Lord, and that'll be tomorrow night. We expect to start in the chapel, and if we outgrow the chapel, we'll move right into here. And next week, I'll be launching a new series, and I can't tell you how long it would be, because uh, it's not finished, and, and uh, I expect that it may be longer than this one, maybe four, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, but it's really an examination of Israel and end-time prophecy, and so we're going to go backwards before we go forwards, and we're going to talk about the validity of prophecy in the Bible about Israel, examine what's been fulfilled, what's being fulfilled, and what is to be fulfilled in the end times. And so it's, a, it's an in-depth study. There's some some amazing facts and figures out of the Bible in regards to how many times Israel is mentioned, how many times, how many prophecies in the Bible are about Israel, uh, why it is uh, God's end time uh, barometer, if you will, for everything that's going on in the world. This class is about world events and Bible prophecy, and in particular about end time prophecy, and we're wrapping up our teaching on Islam exposed. And so we're in the fourth week. Last week we discussed uh, the terrorist organizations that are out there in the world and everything we've talked about up to this point is being fulfilled in the news every day. If you don't think that this is real, if you don't think that this is accurate, if you don't think that this is factual, all you have to do is turn on the radio, the television, look at any news feed and you'll find out what ISIS is doing, what the Muslim Brotherhood is doing, what Boko Haram is doing, all these organizations, how they're advancing, and if you really take a look at what the president spoke at the National Prayer Breakfast in exalting Islam as being, uh, listen, you Christians don't have anything to, to hang your hat on because, you know, you're just as guilty as they are. And uh, the last time I checked that the last Christian beheading was, I don't remember when it was, but I know that there were certain things that were done in history in the name of Jesus. And that's part of the challenge for the Jewish community to accept Jesus because we still remember history and the his, Jesus of history and the Jesus of the Bible are two completely different entities. And we have to remember that. And so when we're talking to people, we have to remember that the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of history, as we examine what was done in the name of Jesus, not at the instruction of Jesus, are completely different. And so we have to remember some of these claims are real. I don't appreciate the way it was presented. Uh, but we do have history that says that the behavior of Christians in past uh, decades, past centuries, was not what we would like it to be, was not... Uh, reflective of, of what the body of Messiah acts like today. But to go back and dredge up that kind of history, I think, is an insult. And for someone that claims to be a Christian but asks, acts like a Muslim, uh, true colors always show through. That was one of the reasons why today's uh, Daily Spark was about, you can tell them by their fruit. So a good tree bears good fruit, a good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear good fruit, and so you have to examine the fruit. So let's uh, open up in prayer, and then we'll get into tonight's teaching. I'll try to get through it all at the, by the 8 o'clock hour. It's taking me to about 8.05 or 8.10. There's a lot of information to go through, and I don't want to cheat you out of the very end, which is, is the, really the equipping part of this entire series. So, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, Father God, we bend the knees of our heart to you, Lord God. We humble ourselves before you, Lord, and we ask that you would give us wisdom, discernment, knowledge, and understanding, Father God, that we might know you more. We might understand your word more, Father God. We might rest in the comfort that you have everything under control, Lord God. But let us examine this information, Father God, so that we are informed, that we know our enemy, that we understand what's going on in the world around us, Father God, and we can see your word coming to light. We dedicate this time to you, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we wrapped up last week, we talked about uh, the terrorist organizations, we talked about a lot of things going on in the world. One of the things that we did in week two was examine uh, the sociological impact of Islam in the world. And so I'm going to kind of bring you current now. We looked at the world at large. We looked at the 22 contiguous nations around Israel, the percentage of is Islamic penetration. We looked at Europe and the advancement of Islam. And now we're going to take a look at some worldwide statistics. According to statistics from the UN, Islam is now the world's second largest religion after Christianity. The UN statistics state that Islam's annual growth rate is 6.4% compared to 1.4% in 
four or six during the same period for Christianity. Why don't you take a minute and digest that? Almost five times faster than Christianity is growing in the world. And so these numbers that we have, we have data from 1989, and then I have updated data from 2009. And uh, when we examine that, we're going to find a startling revelation of what's happening in the world today. Islam in North America since 1989 has increased 25%. In Africa since 1989, it's increased 2.15%. And this is really attributed to church activity in advancing causes in Africa and stemming some of the growth of Islam in Africa. Reinhard Bunke, Heidi Baker, and many of the churches that have outreaches who have over the years ministered and built communities and hospitals and orphanages within Africa are doing a great job. So 2.15% in a nation that is uh, very much targeted by Islam uh, is quite a, a remarkable number. We see what Boko Haram is doing. We studied Boko Haram a little bit. We see what they're doing in Nigeria. Now they're being run out of Nigeria. They've just moved into Cameroon. And so they're advancing what they're doing, leaving behind a trail of blood and tears. And so they're executing people along the way. They're using civilians as shields. And this is the reality of what's going on in the world around us. Now, this isn't highly reported and regularly reported. It's there as a footnote to many of the other news stories, like, uh, you know, Bruce Jenner's becoming a woman, which is, you know, very, very big news. Hey. Islam in Asia since 1989 has increased 12.57%. Islam in Europe, 142.35%. We see that advancement. Now, at one point in time, we saw the ten toes of Daniel being Europe. And we began to think that the EU was a sign that Europe was coming together as an organized singular body, a singular entity. But now that we take a look at this, we find that what it is, it's becoming a stronghold of Islam. And as they advance their way through there, what you'll see is a unified Europe. It'll be unified under the banner of, in the name of Allah, and the cross swords. And so now we understand some of the prophecies about the unity about the one world religion, about the one world order, about the one world currency. And we begin to see this penetration that it's neck and neck with Christianity. When I give you the final number as of today, you'll be startled by that. Islam in Latin America since 1989 has decreased 4.73%. What do you think you attribute that to? The presence of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is very strong in South America. The Pope came out of South America. So the reduction is because they're providing real humanitarian aid and services with, under the Catholic Church. There's a high percentage of, of South Americans that are, are members of the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church operates the way it used to operate here, where you had a local parish open 24 hours a day, you had a food kitchen, you had a pantry, you had meals cooked, you had access to the, to the pastoral team. Uh, when I hear the reports of, of uh, the sexual abuse that came out of the Catholic Church, I don't hear many reports out of South America. It's mostly in America, it's mostly in Europe, but we don't hear those kind of negative reports coming out of South America. So there's, there, there's a different standard, a different uh, vision for Catholicism there. And let me just set the record straight. I know a lot of people preach that Catholics aren't saved. I don't agree with that. Every single Catholic person that I've ever known, uh, if you ask them the question, they believe that Jesus died for their sins and, and rose again and sitting at the right hand of the Father interceding for them, uh, they're going to say yes. And so I believe that if they believe in their heart and profess with their mouth, that's the biblical description of somebody who's, who's saved. So part of this division of the body is perpetuating teaching and thinking that is divisive. It's separative. Uh, one of the, the visions of igniting a nation is to restore unity in the body of Messiah, to break down denominational differences and barriers, to not come under a particular umbrella or covering, but to come under the covering of the Lord. And to do that, not to be a maverick and not to be so independent that you're not biblically sound, but to be ecumenically oriented where you have a vision to bring people together of every background, Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, it doesn't matter. If they need a touch from the Lord, they should, it should be available to them. And if they're not having an authentic encounter where they're going, they should have a place to go to have one that should not compete with their local church. Okay? The local church provides great teaching, great preaching uh, facilities for children, there's all kinds of things that are beneficial about the local church. There's things that the local church could do better, but when you have a service and you have to get people in and out in an hour, there's really only so much you can do. 
So <clears throat> we're going to offer something on the first Friday that's going to not compete, but to augment what's being offered out there. Islam in Australia and the Ocean Pacific area since 1989 has increased 257 percent. This includes Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, remember that, that as we statistically look at India, Pakistan, we're going to begin to see a whole different kind of view. A comprehensive demographic study of more than 200 countries finds that there are 1.57 billion Muslims of all ages living in the world today, representing 23% of an estimated 2009 world population of 6.8 billion. So today's population is 7.3 billion. And if you take 2009, and you take that number right there, 1.57 billion, and you compound that annually by 6.46%, you'll come up with a number today of 2.2 billion. You know what the reported number of Christians are in the world today? 2.2 billion. That means today, Christianity and Islam are neck and neck. So Christianity grows at 1.6%, or 1.46%, whatever the number was. Islam growing at 6% plus, we're losing ground. And so by the time we meet next year, at this same time, Islam will have passed Christianity as the number one religion in the world. It's coming. And we've ignored it for so long, we've ignored this prophet Muhammad in not recognizing him as the prophet that I strongly believe that Jesus and Paul were talking about. The one who came, who heard from an angel and preached a gospel different than the gospel that they preached. And we've seen that now they have followers, 2.2 billion followers of the false prophet. Why would he not be the false prophet of the Bible that we've been forewarned, the man of lawlessness whose entire career was made up of killing, murdering, and sexual sin? As we further examine this, we see that while Muslims are found on all five inhabited continents, more than 60% of the global Muslim population is in Asia and about 20% in the Middle East and North Africa. However, the Middle East North Africa region has the highest percent of Muslim majority countries. Indeed, more than half of the 20 countries and terrorist territories in that region have populations that are approximately 95% Muslim or greater. And this is the vision of Islam, is that through a caliphate, through a government authority, that they take a position of authority, and the state religion, the national religion, becomes Islam. Now, it's no different than in, in Russia, where uh, Russian Orthodoxy was the national religion, no different than Greece and Turkey, where Greek Orthodoxy was the national religion. No different than many of the countries like Rome, Catholicism. So it's really no different, but they seem to be much better at it. And they seem to have more countries which are devoted in a higher percentage of concentration. And because they have government laws, uh, social services, <clears throat> the ability to legislate, implement, punish, treat their wives the way they want to treat their wives, uh, they're growing uh, significantly. More than 300 million Muslims, or one-fifth of the world's Muslim population, live in countries where Islam is not the majority religion. These minority Muslim populations are often quite large. India, for example, has the third largest population of Muslims worldwide. See, we don't realize that. We think Hindu, India, Hindu. But the growing Muslim population, why? Because of the unrest. Wherever there's a depletion of social services, wherever there's poverty, wherever there is an opportunity to come in and make people part of a larger family, a larger brotherhood, a larger community that's going to protect them and offer them something they don't, don't currently have, imagine why would it not be that all the untouchables would become Muslims if they could get better services, they could not be untouchables anymore. Remember, the caste system still exists regardless of what's reported in the news. It's like saying that discrimination does not exist in Birmingham just because we're in 2015 and the civil rights movement seems to have been fulfilled. But that's not the case at all. China has more Muslims in Syria while Russia is the home to more Muslims in Jordan and Libya combined. Of the total Muslim population, 10 to 13 percent are Shias, 87 to 90 are Sunnis. Most Shias between 68 and 80 percent live in just four countries. Iran, Pakistan, India, and Iraq. 
Bible prophecy warns of things that would happen in the future. The Bible warns false prophets would rise, deceiving and leading many away from, from Messiah. The followers of Islam follow a prophet named Muhammad who did rise many years after the prophecies were written. Very interesting. When we take a look at what's happening with people who are considered to be recognized leaders. Shaquille O'Neal. Everybody recognizes the name Shaquille O'Neal, practicing Muslim. Ellen Burstyn from The Exorcist converted from Catholicism and denied Christ and accepted Islam. Dr. Oz. Everybody quotes Dr. Oz, right? Practicing Muslim. So you have people who are in a position of authority, and I've shared with you before, the way ideology works is we introduce it into the home. And when we introduce it in the home, and you look at Dr. Oz and say, oh, sweet Dr. Oz, I... I, I drink his shakes, and I, I buy his supplements, and, and uh, I listen to his advice, and, and he's not a terrorist. And so he's in my living room, and I have this warm feeling about Dr. Oz and, and what a wonderful man he is and all the good work he does, and now it's become acceptable that it's been introduced into my living room. Well, this is the same way it worked back in the 70s with Billy Crystal and a soap opera called Soap, where the first practicing gay character in a sitcom was introduced in the living room. And here it is 40 years later, and we're voting in Birmingham, in Alabama, the state of Alabama, to whether or not to uphold same-sex marriage. So 40 years from the time it was introduced in our living rooms, to the time where it's now becoming an advocacy for rights, I don't remember when the Constitution was amended and when discrimination was further defined as including gays, lesbians, and transsexuals to not be discriminated against. But this is where the 2% have influenced so radically the 98%. And I've said this before, I'm not opposed to the Muslim, I'm not opposed to the gay and lesbian, I'm not, I'm not opposed to any sinner I'm opposed to their sin. And so as a minister of the gospel, I'm to love the sinner and hate the sin and call it sin because that's what the Bible calls it. And if there's a gospel being preached that's a false gospel, a gospel different than the one that Jesus brought to this world and that Paul preached about and taught about, then I have to stand against that gospel being a false gospel. And that the path to heaven is not paved through Islam. The path to heaven is paved through Jesus. And so any teaching that is opposed to that, any teaching that's different than that, any teaching that tries to bring me tolerance for another religious view, another gospel, I am called as a believer in Christ to not be tolerant and not to allow that kind of gospel to be preached in my presence and to stand against it. Just the same way that Christian woman got up at the podium at the Muslim event and said, you know, this is just not true. And this is what we have to do. We have to be bold. Because if we don't stand for Jesus, who's going to stand for us? The followers of Islam follow a prophet named Muhammad who did rise many years after these prophecies were written. The Bible even goes on to warn against religions based on revelations brought by angels that add or teach other ways to heaven than simply believing in the one, the only one who died for all our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead to prove that there is life in heaven and hell. So why is it that we don't recognize that Islam is exactly what the Bible is telling us about? There's only two people that have risen to any acclaim in the world today with any followers whatsoever who say that they were given a gospel through a revelation of an angel. One was Joseph Smith, Church of the Latter-day Saints, and the other one was Muhammad. Now, unless my history is incorrect, that the combination of those two groups, 2.2 billion of one, and I don't know how many hundreds of millions of Mormons there are, but you have two groups who are following a gospel as opposed to the Bible, given through a revelation of angels, when we were specifically told by Paul in Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, 
that anybody that follows that, anybody who preaches that, is accursed. That means they're going to hell. And that we should be on the lookout. We should be on the watch. But yet we haven't had a watchful eye. As the body of Messiah, we have not recognized Muhammad as the man of lawlessness. We have not recognized Muhammad as the false prophet we were warned about. We keep looking to the Vatican. We keep looking somewhere else. We keep waiting for him to be revealed when he already was revealed. It was so subtle in the revelation that 1,400 years ago this man came to power and today has 2.2 billion followers and was given the revelation through an angel he called Gabriel. Joseph Smith had a revelation through, a, I guess he was an Italian angel named Moroni. Oh, is Moroni an Italian name? Sounds, sounds Italian to me. But it's interesting that the Prophet Muhammad started the religion Islam, Muslims, and the Prophet Joseph Smith started his Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on revelations they claim they received from angels. They both teach a different gospel, a different way to heaven than the Bible teaches. Muhammad received his revelation from an angel he called Gabriel about 600 years after this prophetic warning was written. So why don't we see this, that a prophecy is a biblical view of what's going to happen in the future, a forward-looking event that's going to take place. And Jesus warned about us following false messiahs, and Paul warned us about us following any prophet that comes along with a gospel given to him by an angel. Why have we gotten to this point in 2015 where we're just realizing for the very first time that they had to be talking about Muhammad? Am I the only one that's figured this out? That would be scary to me that the Jew from Pittsburgh would have figured this out. That would be scary to me. In many ways, Muhammad and Joseph Smith are very similar. They both claim the angels gave them new revelations because the Jews and the Christians have chained the Bible. Yes. Well, this, this, this concept of a one-world religion, remember that in the end, that the deception of Israel has to take place because there has to be a peace agreement, a peace accord that's got to take place. Okay? Now, that peace accord we read about in Ezekiel 38 when it talks about the battle of Gog Magog, that Israel has to be at peace with its neighbors. How do you garner that peace? Well, they take over these ten kingdoms, they take over the biblically mandated Israel, and all of a sudden the Islamic communities around them are saying, whoa, their power is to be reckoned with, their power is from God. Let's make peace with them. And all of a sudden, they're led into a peace agreement. Who will lead them into that peace agreement? Someone who represents the caliphate of Islam. Has to be an imam, or it could be the 12th imam, the Mahdi himself, who comes and brokers that peace agreement. So, why wouldn't he have that same peace agreement with Rome when Italy will be overrun with Islam? by the time he makes his appearance, that, that the EU, the, what we call the EU, won't be uh, unified around an Islamic caliphate mantle because the way it operates is, is that once they gain that larger than 2%, more, more in the realm of the 5 or 6%, you're no longer allowed in their community to look at what they're doing. And they threaten lawsuit and terrorism and they threaten ang uh, uh, aggressive activities if you try to probe deeper. And so they're advancing, and nobody knows at the rate they're advancing because they're not watching what they're doing because you can't get in behind the curtain. So when we see uh, Riza Khalil, who's a uh, former Muslim, when you see Walid Shobat, when you have uh, Lance Wallano and, and, and other writers out there that are now exposing some of these things and people who are coming to faith. And in Israel, you find a lot of that. You find a lot of Arabs who are coming to faith because they've had an encounter with Jesus in the desert. And when we go to Israel, you'll meet people that will say to you, yes, I had an encounter with Jesus in the desert. They call him Isa. Okay. So does he know Isa? Does he know Jesus? Does he know Yeshua? Does he know uh, Padre Nuestro? Does he, I mean, 
What's the name? The name is in the vernacular. It's the same way it was in, in the book of Acts that everybody heard it in their own language to bring it to their own understanding. So whether or not you respond to Yeshua or Isa or Jesus or whatever it is, Yesu Christo, whatever it is, uh, there's power in the name, whatever name that may be in whatever language you prefer. One of the things that's not apparent either in the Mormon Bible or in the Koran, although it's, they claim that the Jews and Christians have modified the Bible, but there's no listing of what passages of Scripture have been changed. Now, I can tell you with very strong authority that the Torah has not been altered, not one stroke of the pen. But we have parchment, we have remnants from Torahs from... 2,000 years ago, from 2,500 years ago. We have the, the writings of Isaiah, which are identical in their original script from, from the, the Dead Sea Scrolls over 2,000 years ago that are identical to the, what's printed today. So we know that the oral tradition of passing on the Word of God, that God gave the Word to Moses. Moses came down from the mountain and gave it to Aaron. Before Moses died, he gave it to Joshua, and then Joshua gave it to all of Israel. And so this has been passed down for generation to generation in the Jewish community, in the study of the Jewish community, that an Orthodox Jewish child begins studying and memorizing Torah at the age of five years old. By eight years old, he's memorized it. By 13, he's called to the Torah to give his commentary and is entitled to then sit with the rabbis at that point in time and learn and teach because he's memorized it. And so we don't do that. We do Bible verses, and, and uh, hopefully by the time a child is 13... I agree. I completely agree. That's confirmation from the Holy Spirit. But we know it's intact and we can defend the integrity of the Torah. Now as far as the New Testament is concerned and the, the Greek author, the authors writing in Greek, which for many of them was a second language, think about Paul. He was from Turkey. Well, I don't know what the language of the day was, if it was Greek or it was Turkish or what the language was at the time, but he was a Hebrew speaker and a Hebrew scholar. So the language that the New Testament was written in was Greek. It may have been a second language. It was probably not a primary language for any of the authors. And so when we look at the vernacular of the times, we, we, we know that uh, even though like the word yoke, which is used when Jesus said, take my yoke. Remember that? Well, yoke in Hebrew, it means teaching. And so when we think about it that way, instead of a uh, a piece of wood over a, a cattle's shoulders, okay, which doesn't really make sense that he would, he would burden us or yoke us or, or put a light yoke on us. When we understand it from the Hebrew, the word yoke means teaching. So when you take his teaching, his teaching's light. It's not as heavy as the Torah. It wasn't so weighty and so, so full of laws and so full of, of sacrifice. It was about, you know, you want, you want to be right, you, you want to be... Uh, um, you know, blessed are the meek, for they, they, will, they will inherit the earth. You know, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall know peace. Uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And we go back to the Torah, and it says God will have mercy on who he has mercy, and compassion on who he has compassion. But Jesus tells us that in this teaching, in this yoke that he gives us, that the way to have mercy is to be merciful. He's unraveling the secrets of God for us so we understand that teaching. So, yes, there could be things which are changed in the New Testament that w would have to be codified and people would have to go back to the original text and, and read it and translate it and put it back in the vernacular. I think the Tree of Life Bible, has a ten, uh, their intention was to do that. Uh, but they attack the Bible and the integrity of the Bible, but they don't back it up with any substantiated claims. So there's nothing that they have which is proof of a document that says, here's the way it was, and here's what you changed it to do. It's just a, an attack on the infidels. Uh, their, books add, their new books add nothing new, and they just attack the fact that Jesus is who and who the Bible says he is, and both revert back to the old form of religion, which convinces the people that way into heaven can somehow be earned through good works or deeds or killing Jews and Christians. So you know that the Islamic view is that you kill Jews and Christians, you make your way to heaven. It's a little bit more intense than accepting Jesus. 
So none of their followers are follower of any religion who tries to convince us we can balance the scales of judgment in our favor through good works, deeds, or money will ever have the secure promise and hope of heaven given to all who simply trust in Jesus to save them. And here's what Paul writes. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you on the grace of Christ. Grace means you can't earn heaven. He paid for you. To a different gospel, which is n not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. This is pretty clear. In the way Paul wrote his letters, he wrote them in a particular way that, not intending it to become doctrine the way we've called it doctrine, but he was writing it to the behavior of the people he was addressing. And so therefore, if we can identify with that behavior, then that letter's to us. If we're exhibiting that same legalistic behavior, if we're still trying to promote the fact that you can get into heaven by working your way there, if we're doing those things, then this letter applies to us. If we're, we're promoting any gospel other than the gospel that's contained from Matthew to Revelation, then he says, let him be accursed. Jesus himself said that many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because lawlessness symbol abound, the love of many for Jesus will grow cold. So when we look at these Hollywood people that are turning from Jesus, uh, Ice Cube, Ice T, Ice, what, Berg, what's the guy's name? Ice Cube is now a practicing Muslim, was a Christian. There's a number of them. You can go on the web and you can look at the long list of practicing Christians or Catholics that have converted to Islam. And so, why? Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. People still want their ears tickled. They still want to hear a feel-good message. They don't want to hear about sin anymore. They don't want to hear about hellfire and brimstone. The way it was presented, I can understand that. But the truth of the gospel is still true today, as true today as it was 2,000 years ago, as true as it was when Moses said, one will come after me, you are to follow him and do everything he teaches you, otherwise you'll be cut off from your people. An understanding of who your people are, if you are grafted into the promises of Abraham, you're grafted into exactly what Abraham did as a Gentile. You remember what Abraham did as a Gentile? He followed God. You see, the promises of Israel is through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but you're grafted into the promises of Abraham, not Isaac and Jacob. So this idea of spiritual identity, spiritual Israel, this whole hijacking of, of Israel now being the church is not authentic because it's, what it's saying is if you're a Gentile believer in your, your, the inheritance of Abraham, you're doing exactly what happened to Abraham when he followed God. He was blessed of God and its behavior, which is ex expected of a believer to follow in the footsteps of a Gentile. He didn't become Jewish, per se. As a matter of fact, I don't know that we would ever call him Jewish. The first Jewish-born child would be Isaac, because he was the first one to pass through the covenant of circumcision. So was this a conversion of Abraham? Maybe when he changed the name from Abram, but, but the name Israel was given to Jacob. And so, who is Israel? A good question for Israelology. We'll answer that question. Who is Israel? Is there a spiritual Israel? Is there a physical Israel? Is it the land of Israel? Is it the people? Is it the church? Is it the grafted in, the ingrafted? Is it one new man? What is Israel? Matthew 24, 23 through 27 says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here's, here's the Messiah, or there, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand, meaning, listen, this is a prophecy. So the greatest prophet of the Bible is who? Jesus. The one who spoke the words of God, the one who spoke the words of the Father, was Jesus. And he's saying, I'm telling you what's going to happen in the future. And you need to recognize and understand it. But we have all been lulled into a false sense of security because we've been led to believe that we have to have this future look, and everybody wants it to be the Pope and the Catholic Church. I don't know why everybody's so intent on, on uh, uh, demonizing the Catholic Church. It, it's almost 
it's almost an obsession of end time teachers to point out that this the Antichrist will come out of the Catholic Church. I don't understand it. I don't understand why anybody would point to anybody who is in the body of Messiah and begin to refer to them as the Antichrist. I could be wrong. We'll all find out at the same time, won't we? Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out, or look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it, for as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, Muslims believe, as taught in the Hadith, that Jesus is going to return first to Damascus. Isn't that interesting? The Bible tells us he'll return to Jerusalem, but he's going to return first to Damascus. And when he returns from heaven, it will be first to Damascus and not Jerusalem as taught in the Bible. And this is found in Muslim book 41, number 7015. When reading this, understand that the Dajjal would be the Antichrist of the Bible. And let me read it to you. And it would be at this very time that Allah would send Christ, son of Mary, and he would descend at the white minaret in the eastern side of Damascus, wearing two garments, lightly dyed with saffron, and placing his hands on the wings of two angels. When he would lower his head, there would fall beads of perspiration from his head, and when he would raise it up, beads like pearls would scatter from it. Every non-believer who would smell the odor of his self would die, and his breath would reach as far as he would be able to see. He would then search for him, the Dajjal, which is the Antichrist of Islam, until he would catch hold of him at the gate of Lud and would kill him. So their teaching is, is that end-time prophecy, that Jesus returns to Damascus and defeats on behalf of Islam, the Antichrist, the anti-Mahdi, the anti-Messiah of Islam, and does battle. Remember that the belief is, is that, that Jesus, when he said, I'm going to leave this place and I will send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, Islam believes that Muhammad was the Holy Spirit sent. Within Islam, Muhammad is referred to as an angel of light. Isn't that interesting? Who else called himself an angel of light? Satan, Lucifer, an angel of light. And it's interesting that throughout the Bible, every time there's an authentic, there is a counterfeit. And the counterfeit is often very close to the authentic. And we should be students of the Bible and studying the authentic so we can recognize the counterfeit. But look at this deception that's been perpetrated over the world and finally is making the world's attention. But there's already 2.2 billion Practicing Muslims in the world growing at six point something percent, five times faster than Christianity. I think we missed the signals. We missed the sign. But now that we're aware of it, what are we going to do about it? It's interesting that the highest level of Iran's leadership believes that there's only two prophetic triggers before the return of their long awaited Messiah, and one of them just happened the death of 90 year old King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia. See, they have their own prophecies and their own events which they, they look to to bring about the end times. Iran's leaders believe that they can facilitate the coming of the last Islamic Messiah. They believe the century-old Hadith predicts this and that the time is close. The second trigger is the destruction of Israel. The first trigger, which is the death of Abdullah, is a sign that the second trigger needs to take place. Once King Abdullah dies, that will tell them the time is now. Well, he just died. And what are we seeing? Are we seeing an increase in news reports about ISIS? Or are we seeing an increase in, in terrorist activities around the world? Both. Now we're reporting from, from Cameroon. Now we're reporting from Iran. Now we're reporting from Iraq. Now we're reporting from Jordan. Now we're reporting from Syria. And how interesting that this prophecy about Damascus lays the foundation for a very deep understanding. Because if a Muslim believes that Jesus will come to Damascus, then we really have to examine this because I think we have a door that's opening for all of us. The Bible is very clear that just prior to the second coming of Jesus, the city of Damascus is going to be totally destroyed during a war with Israel. Isn't that interesting? At the very place that their prophecy says that Jesus will return and defeat the Antichrist, the anti-Mahdi, 
we're believing from the Bible that Damascus will be destroyed in the Psalm 83 war. And we taught extensively on the Psalm 83 war. There's a three DVD set that if you haven't gotten it, you should get it. Uh, to understand these ten nations that God says in Psalm 83 through Asaph the seer, he predicts that these ten kingdoms, Edom, the Hagrites, the Assyrians, the Ishmaelites, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau would be destroyed in a war and that Israel would expand their tent pegs to the biblically mandated borders that God gave to Abraham. Well, included in that is Syria. And the Jewish prophet Isaiah talked about the destruction, gave an oracle about Damascus. So you have 3,500 years ago, you have Asaph talking about what's going to happen, and then you have Isaiah foretelling it again, confirming the word of the Lord. The destruction of Damascus is a key sign that the day of the Lord is very near. Isaiah 17, 1, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. This is going to occur on the Psalm 83 war. So when study Isaiah chapter 17, it starts with the destruction of Damascus and ends with the battle of Armageddon, which includes the second coming of Jesus. This is why the destruction of Damascus is a key indicator that the day of the Lord is at hand. This war lights the fuse directly to Armageddon and Christ's second coming. When we examine the scripture further, Isaiah 17, 12, it says, Woe to the multitude of many people, which make a noise like the noise of the seas, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them, and they shall flee far off, and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind, and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Verse 14, And behold, at evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us, and the lot of them that rob us. Now, Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 35 are both about the destruction of Edom. Damascus is going to be destroyed at the same time of the war found in these two chapters. Both of these chapters end with scriptures about knowing and turning to the Lord. In Isaiah 17, the destruction of Damascus results in many Syrians turning to the Holy God of Israel. Now remember that it's not the nation of Syria. The last nation to come to the Lord was Nineveh. Thank you. It was Nineveh. And remember, it was because Jonah prophesied over Nineveh and as a, as a prophet of God spoke to them in the head of Nineveh, as it is, as the head goes, so goes the body. The head of Nineveh declared, yes, your God, I believe your God is the God of heaven and earth, and I accept him, and all of Nineveh came to faith that day. It doesn't say all of Syria will come to faith. It says many. The ones who run away will see the destruction of Damascus. Why? Because Syria is an Islamic country. In Islamic nations, they pray five times a day, and they study the teachings of the Koran. And the Koran and the holy writings also state that Damascus will be the place that Jesus returns. And that will be the, become the beginning of the end time. But what if Damascus isn't there? Then Jesus doesn't come to Damascus, and their prophecy is refuted. Now we have something tangible to hold on to in the Bible. Isaiah 17, 3, The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the, rem and the remnant of Syria, and they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Very interesting that this door is opening. You don't have to be an expert in the Koran or an expert in the Hadith or an expert on Islam in any way, shape, or form. You just have to know one thing. That the Quran teaches, and the Hadith teaches, and the sacred writings teach that Jesus will return to Damascus. And our text tells us that Damascus will be no more. There will not be a Damascus. There will be a ruinous heap. So if it's a ruinous heap, and Jesus can't come back there, then their prophecy is now invalid. It's a fallacy. And if Damascus is destroyed in accordance with Psalm 83 and Ezekiel 35 and... Isaiah 17, then we have something tangible to hold on to that is proven to be valid, which invalidates their own text. And so if part of the Bible is a lie, all of the Bible is a lie. If part of the Koran is a lie, then all of the Koran must be a lie. If it's to be a sacred text, it cannot be, it has to be above error. It has to be above reproach. There can be no contradictions in it. Yet the, 
even the Quran contradicts itself, but that's not their definition of sacred. But when a prophecy is refuted, directly refuted by something that the Bible predicts and it becomes real and true that Isaiah 17 predicts the destruction of Damascus, now we have something real to hold on to. One nugget. You know, one nugget is really all you need to open up an intelligent dialogue. Psalm 83.16 says, Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and troubled forever. Yea, let them be put to shame and perish. That men that may know that thou, whose name alone is Adonai, are the most high over all the earth. And so this is the prayer of intercession by Asaph. Asaph was not just a minister of music under King David. He was a seer, choser in the Hebrew, which meant that God gave him visions. Daniel was a choser, a seer. He had visions from God. And when God revealed this vision of the destruction of the ten nations that surrounded Israel, that stood against Israel, Asaph interceded before God and petitioned God that in this destruction that something good would come out of it, that his name would be glorified. And wasn't that the intention of God throughout history, throughout the Exodus, throughout Genesis, all the time that God's name would be glorified? He orchestrated certain things so that even the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, he orchestrated when Pharaoh's heart became softened and he was willing to let the Israelites go. God hardened his heart so God would get the glory and it would be apparent to all that it was God that provided the deliverance and the exodus from bondage. So Asaph is petitioning God to make sure that good comes out of this, that, that Israel is preserved and safe. But the destruction is complete, but people would come to faith. Ezekiel 35, As that this rejoiceth the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee, thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all Idumea, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. So again, the destruction of Damascus and those parts of Syria that are referred to here will bring about the knowledge that God is the God of heaven and earth, the one true God, the God of Israel. So if the Muslims know this prophecy in the Hadith about the second coming and Damascus is then obliterated, this could be one of the main reasons why Muslims turn from Islam to the God of Israel. They'll see the Bible as the word of God, the final authority, and not Islam. Now, I believe with the current behavior of Syria towards Israel that the test is soon going to take place. We see this. We see the posturing of ISIS. We see the, the uh, Iran is sending soldiers to the border of Syria and Lebanon. There's already been a skirmish between the Lebanese, the, the ISIS of Lebanon, and uh, the northern border of Israel. Uh, Israel responded, and they stopped fighting which is primarily the case in the Middle East. Because when Israel finally responds, people don't realize how serious Israel is about the right to defend. And you know, this right to defend has existed since the day of King Xerxes, who was the king of what? Persia. Persia is Iran. So isn't it interesting that Israel's right, biblical right to defend itself, was an edict that's never been revoked, and it was issued out of Iran. It seems ironic that that should be the case, that their number one enemy is Iran. So the destruction of Damascus would be the tangible proof to Muslims that the authority of the Bible, or the authority of the Bible over Islam. If Damascus is destroyed in this coming year, it will give Christians the tools necessary to challenge Muslims about the Bible being the word of God and the Lord Jesus is the only begotten Son of God because their scripture says that Jesus is not the begotten Son, that God that they believe in Allah does not beget, and therefore he did not have a son. But if this is the case and this prophecy exists, that the word of God says that Damascus will be destroyed, and it's confirmed in Psalm 83 and confirmed in Isaiah 17, and it goes directly against the prophecy of Islam that begins with the event that King Abdullah dies. So now the next the second event has to be the destruction of Israel, meaning that the Psalm 83 battle will ensue. It won't take long. I can assure you it will not be a long battle. Uh, if it started on June 1st, it would be over before we got there on the 19th. Not going to take that long. Clean up on all four. 
It's going to be a uh, complete and total, and those ten groups are annihilated. They're wiped out. They're, they're scattered. They're no longer. And those cities are now being rebuilt by Israel because it's now within their territory. But think about this. Jesus was in the world. Jesus said, well, I'm in the world. I'm the light of the earth. And then he looks at us, and he says to us, I'm leaving here. You're the light of the earth. Let your light so shine that men would see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. So we know that this angel of light, this false angel of light, Muhammad, comes into the world and brings a gospel that's not true, the false gospel, a different way to heaven by killing Jews and Christians. A different approach to the scripture. Jesus is relegated now to, to a, uh, a prophet who predicts the coming of Muhammad and is then overshadowed by the man Muhammad, even though he was married many times and killed many people and guilty of sexual sin and was poisoned by a stepdaughter, uh, he's still deified within Islam. So if we take a look at the text of John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So we're believers in Jesus. That means that information is not for our edification, it's for our equipping to fulfill the command to go and make disciples of men, to share the gospel, to share the good news. It wasn't just for you. As a matter of fact, in Romans 11, it says if you're Gentile, it was not just for you. It was for you for the purpose of provoking Israel to envy. That's why your light must shine, because when I see it, I want to have what you have. I want... You have something different than I have. You've lost children. You've had terrible things have been to your life, and you're praying, and you're always giving praise to God. Why do you do that? Well, that's an opportunity. That's a door that opens. It says, I see something different about you. What is it that's different about you? You know, the guy across the street from Pakistan, you might not know that because you probably pay at the pump. Well, if you pay at the pump, you don't interact with people. You interact with machines. And if you have an iPhone, you don't interact with people. You interact with machines. But guess what? We're believers. We're supposed to interact with people. So I don't pay at the pump, even though it's more convenient. I go and I talk to the guy from Pakistan. I ask him, where are you from? He says, I'm from Pakistan. So you Muslim? Yes, yes. Why did you leave Pakistan? Well, because of what the Muslims did. I don't want to live like that. And I'm afraid it's coming to America. And I don't want to live like that here. What? Well, what happened? Oh, they burned our villages, they took our women, they did these kind of things, and we had to get out because the government was now all Islamic, and they were implementing new laws and new rules, and life as we knew it changed. And we were constantly at war. We were at war with each other, and we were war at war with our neighbors. And so I got my family out in the 80s. He doesn't like what he sees. He doesn't like what's happening in the world around him. He doesn't want what he sees coming. And he's a Muslim. Imagine that dialogue and asking him what he knows about Jesus. And I'll tell you, I know a lot about Jesus. Well, tell me what you know about Jesus. And so I go over there and I pump my gas and I go in and I pay for it. I go in with the credit card first and then I go to the pump and then I have to go in and settle up and do all those things. It gives me multiple opportunities. I always buy a Coke Zero from him. Always in a conversation. Why? Because when this Damascus thing happens, when that happens, I'll be right over there saying, hey, do you know about that prophecy about Damascus? Jesus comes to Damascus? Well, Damascus is no more. But my prophecy says that Damascus can be destroyed. Let me show you right here. It says Damascus can be a ruinous heap. And look at the news. It's a ruinous heap. My God foretold that, and your God didn't. You still believe in the truth of your God? Why? Because I'm going to preach the gospel always. What's the gospel? Me showing interest in this man's life. Me showing interest in his story. I come from an immigrant family. Thank you. 
So when people ask me about what it's like coming from Eastern Europe, what Croatia, Hungary, uh, Ukraine, go on these trips. I take people there. Hosea wrote, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. These DVDs contain a great deal of factual knowledge to be shared. It's information that's just not for your edification, it's for your equipping. You might enter into conversation and say, hey, did it ever occur to you that maybe the man of lawlessness the Bible was talking about, the false prophet, was Muhammad? Let's take a look at why you might think that. Imagine the level of depth of conversation you can have with fellow believers when all of a sudden they're not listening to Jack Empey, Jack Van Empey, or, or uh, one of these other televangelists. Perry Stone, Perry Como. And here's the admonition from Paul. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Why do we expect the fact that somebody that's a Muslim adherent? My understanding is the gospel is preached to everybody but the Jews and the Muslims. In my experience, I went 44 years of my life with never having been witness to. Nobody ever told me about Jesus. Nobody. 44 years. Nobody ever talked to me about Jesus. Because they loved me. They were going to love me to death. Exactly what they were going to do. They loved me so much they were going to love me to death. Well, we didn't want to offend you. Oh, but you'd rather send me to hell. You'd rather see me in hell than offend me? I, I, I'd rather have you offend me. Don't do me any favors. Imagine the opportunity in the workplace where we have Muslim co-workers or you have Muslim shop owners or you have encounters like that. Imagine having a dialogue, not from ignorance, but from intelligence. Because you love what you have so much. I have not seen many happy Muslims on TV, have you? Do you see the joy of the Lord, the joy of the Spirit of the Lord on anybody you ever see interviewed? I don't see happy Muslims anywhere. Imagine the word of kindness that I give to this gentleman at the, at the gas station. He lights up. Nobody talks to him. They buy cigarettes and beer and nobody talks to him. They have no interest in him whatsoever. He brought his daughters over to say hi. These are my two daughters. They came over. They were little when we came over, but, but when we came. Because they're people. Where did Jesus go? Invited them to my church? I don't have a church. I'm an itinerant. <laughs> but, but listen, you have to, if you're going to invite somebody to your church, you have to be willing to go to their mosque. It's a little bit different. A little bit different than a Jewish person. A little bit, yeah, it's a little bit different than a Jewish person. If, if you were to ask me to go to your church, I'd tell you to come to my synagogue first. You come check me out first, then I'll come check you out. Well, you open that door, then you're committed to do that goodwill gesture, and that's not what you're called to do. You're called to be set apart. You're not called, you can't jump in a swimming pool and not get wet. But there's a way to preach the gospel. There's a way to minister to people in a way that doesn't say, come to my church. You can tell them, look, you, you extend love to somebody who we would consider to be unlovely. Isn't that what Jesus did? Let me ask you a question. How many in here are without sin? That means I'm talking to a room full of sinners. A sinner is talking to fellow sinners. Fellow sinners, welcome. You're welcome in this place. So why is their sin any greater than ours was when we came to the Lord? And why is their sin any greater than our sin was this morning? It's not. It's the same thing. It's, same, it's the other side that Jesus said to go to. And so when we look at this, we have a call to action. This is my argument with the rapture. How can they call on one they have not believed in? How can they believe in one of whom they have not heard? So if all the believers get taken out, who's going to tell anybody about Jesus? Are they just going to figure it out that everybody left because of Jesus? I don't think that's the way the world works. That's me going on record again. But here's what it says in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. It doesn't say all nations with the exception of the Jews and the Muslims. Sure, it's harder than your white Anglo-Saxon Protestant friend. It's harder. 
It's harder to talk to people that, were, that, that, that are on the other side. And then baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, the promise of Islam is the Mahdi will come. You follow the prophet Muhammad, but Muhammad doesn't come back. I follow the prophet Jesus, and Jesus comes back. Where's my hope, and where's their hope? Their hope is in some guy that went into hiding in 920 A.D. And that he'll return from hiding after 11 or 1,200 years in hiding. I would say that he probably needs to change clothes or... Something needs to be different. But my Jesus is coming back. And their prophet's not. And so the door is open as we look at history and we look at things around us. The things aren't going to change unless we affect change. It's not going to change on its own. It says, don't just be hearers of the word, be doers of the word. And we've got to share. Otherwise, what's going to happen? We'll be standing here next year reading, hearing about 2.4 billion, 2.5 billion, 2.8 billion, 3 billion, and Christianity dropping below 2 billion, and all of a sudden we see advancing Islam because an ideology is advancing at a rapid rate five times faster than Christianity. Because we're not talking about it anymore. We leave church on Sunday and we don't talk about it anymore because we're not called to action. Well, this teaching was about a call to action. This whole teaching was about telling you what's going on, telling you biblically about what Jesus foretold and what Paul foretold, looking at history and saying, is Muhammad the false prophet? Is Muhammad the man of lawlessness? And is the Mahdi who is to come, the 12th Imam, is he the Antichrist? And will he lead the battle of the United Nation of Islam, the one world order? Because when you are the majority ideology in the world, you are the controlling factor. And when you take a look at the wealth of Islam versus the wealth of Christianity, we don't have oil wells and oil-rich countries in, in our domain, but they do, and we're dependent on them. And so when it comes time for the energy of America to get cut off because we're not following Islam, guess what's going to happen in Washington when the outcry is, I'm cold, I'm hungry, I can't run my car, I can't go to work, I can't make a living, I can't pay taxes. All of a sudden we become friends and we enter into an accord and we now see the handwriting on the wall of what's going to happen in the world. But we're not supposed to be fearful. And it's I'm sorry? You're saying that it, you, you've heard Okay, but I have to repeat it so everybody can hear it. After Desert Storm, you read in the newspaper. Samaritan's Purse, yes. Okay. Mm hmm Well, they are. Okay, let me, let me, let me, yeah, let me, let me give you statistically. Let me give you the facts. Okay, of 7.2 billion people in the world, you believe that the prophecy about the, the gospel going out to everyone has been fulfilled, and that's not the case. Of 7.2 billion people in the world, there are still 3.5 billion people that don't hear the gospel, that are not reached with Bibles, because their governments control all the information. Yes, there's great advancements being made, but for us to rest on the knowledge and believe the communications goes to the four corners of the world and believe that the gospel is reaching every ear and that it's available. As I assured you, I lived in America, born in America. 44 years of my life, nobody shared the gospel. Let me tell you something. It didn't reach this Jewish boy's ear in Pittsburgh. And so our thoughts that Bibles are available and the gospel is available, the gospel is available, but there have to be people to preach it. And the people have to go out there. Okay? And there's many, many organizations, and they are making advancements, but Islam is, is five times faster, statistically growing, right, in places where Christianity should be a stronghold. America used to be a Christian nation. What are we now? We're a moderate nation, if that. We're a tolerant nation, where we've legislated abortion, we've taken prayer out of school, and we've, we've legislated same-sex marriage. So is America a Christian country? It's not because the biblical values are being abrogated 
by liberal legislation. All right, it's 8.07, let me close. Okay, DVDs are available, flyers about the service tomorrow night. Uh, the address for the Gardendale meeting, which will start next Tuesday, and information uh, on the website about Israelology, the new teaching that I'll be doing, and uh, encourage you to come back and bring people to it. I know people like to get in at the beginning of a series. It's harder to catch up, but the DVDs are always available immediately following, so this DVD will be available next week. We try to make that readily available to you. If you bought DVDs one and two, and you get three tonight, take a DVD case, it's a four case, and uh, Glenda and uh, Linda will help you out with that. Take it home with you, put three in there, and then come back next week and get number four and finish out the, the case. If you can't get, get here, you can go on the website, ignitingnation.com. There's an order form for all the teachings, and you can order them, send them out, mail them. It's a small $5 shipping and handling fee. All right, let's close. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for opening the eyes of our heart, Father God. We thank you for illuminating, Lord God, shedding your light on what's going on around us, Father God. And we ask you, Lord God, to equip us, to strengthen our faith, to stand fast on your word, Father God, that we might be doers of your word, not just hearers of your word. Father, we know that faith without works is death, Lord God, and this is the work that you've called us to do, to share the good news, to go out and make disciples of men, to share what we've learned, Father God, with others to open the eyes, Father, of those that say they know you, but they really know about you. And Lord God, our desire is that they might know you more. Father, I send the people here out with your blessing, that may the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.